Hello, everybody. My name's Lawrence Dawkins Hall, and I'm an applicant support mentor for the Science Council. And what I'm going to be specifically talking about today in this video is completing your competency form in the context of a CSI application. So what do you talk about as a CSI? There are various ways of populating the form, OK? You can actually, in the context of the subcompetencies, you can use one example and you can actually weave that as a narrative for the different com competencies. You can recontextualize, for example, field work can be used to address the different competencies, or you can give different examples for different competencies. This isn't an objective exercise. There are no right and wrong answers, okay. So multiple competencies or one competency recontextualized for the different competencies A to D. I won't specifically be talking about E because that's CPD, okay. So as I talked about in a previous video, as a precursor to completing your competency form, it's a good idea to plan proactively as well as reactively. So think about this in terms of CPD, keep a log. And then when you're ready to actually populate your competency form in the online application portal or CAP, copy and paste in, okay. I've mentioned the fact that you can sort of juxtapose um, different competencies um, or use one competency and weave a sort of narrative uh, for the different competencies. What I'd say is think laterally or outside the box. So the idea of um, registration per se is that it looks at you in the round. It isn't something that looks at your technical endeavors only, okay? So think about everything that you bring to the workplace. Think about other things you may do um, away from the main theme of your job. So if you work in a lab on a project, perhaps you're involved in equality and diversity issues, Athena Swan, technician commitment. So weave those into your competencies as examples in addition to what you do day to day, week to week. And take your time, OK, such that what you have in a draft is polished. And when you actually come to commence your application proper, copy and paste. So these are the actual examples of the competencies, application of knowledge and understanding, personal responsibility, interpersonal communication skills and professional practice. OK, so application of knowledge and understanding in the round is, as it said, it's to actually apply knowledge to new situations, to update your existing knowledge. And that can actually be as a sort of report in addition to empirical practical work if you're in the lab at the bench. Personal responsibility is about how you deal with your own responsibilities. As a CSI, you might manage multiple projects, but you may have dependents, okay? You might be training other people. It's also about um, carrying out your duties in the context of, of wider regulatory standards, and some of those standards may be environmental. Interpersonal skills or communication is really, as it says on the tin, it's about effective communication with specialists, that is fellow scientists, for example, or fellow IT or fellow teaching technicians and non-specialists. And the latter, I think, is particularly important for CSI because a CSI will deal with people in finance based on the fact that they have budgets. They deal with uh, engineers who, whilst they may understand the engineering principles of their equipment, will not be versed in the specific molecular biology techniques or chemistry techniques, for example, used in your lab. So they're classed as non-specialists. OK, it's about actually mentoring others and demonstrating effective leadership as well. Perfect professional practice is about scoping and planning projects. It's about contributing to organization of tasks and resources. And as a CSI, that actually might be not just what goes on, your, on in your lab, but also actually goes on outside your lab. It may be structural. It may be that as a CSI senior technician, you're actually conferring with estates and services to procure structural um, improvements to your lab. That comes under improvement and change. If we go back and try and give you specific examples of competency A, which is really your technical competency, competency, okay, to try and sort of recapitulate your own practices, okay. So application of knowledge and understanding in the context of those 
um, three bootstrap statements can be adapting improving methods and the actual downstream data analysis. If you're working in a lab, it's not just the experiments. It can actually be about what you do in terms of improving data, et cetera. It can be trialing new equipment or methods for research or indeed teaching. It can be troubleshooting data and experimental methods. And finally, um, res responding to an un unexpected situation. That's exemplified by the way that perhaps you, you actually are sort of involved with lockdown provision changes associated with lockdown. It may be that there are and almost certainly would be different working practices and key workers and you may play a role in what they do and how they do it to make it COVID compliant. So that's a good example in uh, competency A in a current situation. Examples of personal responsibility would be um, as a CSI training and managing multiple projects. It could actually be uh, health and safety, and in particular, implementing uh, a COSH um, database forum, um, such as Sevron, you might be involved in actually getting that off the ground. Another thing that's particularly uh, sort of germane at the moment is actually waste streams and lab sustainability problems. As a CSI, it's likely that you, as opposed to more junior technicians, in association with lab heads, will be responsible for things like tip recycling policies and other green sort of efforts um, that are part and parcel of lab sustainability. It can be about producing standard operating procedures. It can be about the implementation of new clinical methods, such as the Human Tissue Act, um, quality control, ISO, or other QC standards. As I've mentioned before, it can actually be standards associated with the infrastructure, estates and services, structural sort of uh, rearrangements of the workplace or lab you're in. Interpersonal communicating uh, is about communicating specialist and non-specialist knowledge. As a CSI in particular, you will be involved not just with specialist scientists who you help to train, you help to train on equipment as well as at the bench, or if you're as part of an IT initiative, teaching them particular programs. It's likely as well that you're going to be involved a lot more than other the other two registers of technicians with non-specialists. And by, by that, I mean dealing with outside companies, dealing with engineers if there are equipment problems, okay, working up new methods in association with those engineers. It may be that you're responsible for budgeting of stocks in the lab that other technicians look after. You may be the person that communicates with finances about how the spending is going and if you're actually within budget. And then it can actually be um, COVID, Teams and Zoom. So, it isn't just the actual type of people that you work for, it's actually the mode of communication. So for example, you can talk about the fact in these various scenarios, specialist and non-specialist alike, that you actually um, use say PowerPoint presentations or informal chats. You may present at conferences orally in association with PowerPoint slides, or increasingly because of COVID and lockdown, it may be that you are instrumental in association with others, maybe your own team, in actually communicating remotely in the presence of lockdown by either Teams or Zoom. So it's about mode of communication about as well as who you communicate with. I mentioned before that as a CSI, if there are wider departmental or indeed university or workplace initiatives such as Athena Swan, you could talk about those. Once again, it can be talking uh, about, based on scenarios in A and B, talking to estates and finances. It can be how you manage teams. And that can include things like mentoring. And if somebody has, um, say, a problem with isolation linked to lockdown, being involved with their health and well-being. Professional practice updating standards. So this can be about updating equipment, um, equipment budgeting for new equipment. As a teaching technician, if you are a senior teaching technician in a school, it may be actually about improving curricula, okay, in association with the teachers. It can be something as simple as lab reorganization and step and setup. 
scoping and planning new projects when you're getting something new off the ground. And that is something that you'd do in terms of budgeting, necessary equipment. And obviously, as a senior technician, that's something you do in association with the person that controls the uh, purse strings. Finally, uh, Athena Swan as an example of improved practice. But don't forget, uh, data protection is a big thing at the moment, and that's been introduced in a higher education setting in the last two years. And so that might be something that you're involved in rolling out across your department. OK, the competency report itself um, consists of five competencies. I've mentioned four because E is synonymous with CPD. Each one consists of three or four subcategories or subcompetencies. And what I'd say is that you need to provide from the last three years, one to three case studies, okay, based on your reflective practice, using the sorts of examples that I've enunciated, okay. In terms of structuring the answer, okay, you want to actually do it in a way that's considered comprehensive. So for each of your reflective practices or scenarios within your subcompetencies, outline the problem or situation for starters. OK, talk about the specifics of it, then talk about uh, what solutions you posed and just as importantly, which one you selected in order to go ahead and actually address the problem or situations. OK, and one that I cannot stress enough is output. OK. Be judici judicious in terms of what you select. So it's not enough to actually say that you've identified a situation or problem, you've implemented what you consider to be the most optimal solution, but then you don't talk about whether it solved the problem. So pick an example for each sub competency where your reflective practice through evidence has comprehensively addressed the problem or situation. And what I'd say is it's better to have one competency in terms of the aforementioned detail than a series of competencies where you don't specifically highlight the outputs, okay? Have you solved the problem or situation? So keeping that in mind, there are, um, basically there's an acronym here that uh, sums that up. Situation, task, action or result, okay? Think of your answers in terms of that acronym. So I've talked about the fact that I've really itemized the sorts of pertinent examples that might inspire your own reflective scenarios. And I've mentioned the fact that there is a word crafting to the answers. OK, so once you've done that, once you've actually populated your competency form and filled out the other associated aspects of CAP, you've hit that send button. What happens next? So this is really the end of the journey. OK. So the competency form is actually independently assessed by two assessors, and that's to ensure that the, there is blind assessment and therefore it's fair. There's no inbuilt in bias. OK, the process can take anything from three weeks to two months. The former three weeks is where the two uh, assessors concur. And if one basically says there's a strong report, generally the assessor will either agree or they'll say there's minor alterations needed. So let me just say that it's rare for somebody to fail outright. And let me also say that, um, in fact, you need to resubmit your competency form three times for that to happen. So the idea is that the assessors, if they do disagree, or if both say that the competency report needs more detail, and that's usually the thing assessors say, it will get bounced back to you and you will have an opportunity to actually incorporate suggestions that the assessors have made and then actually send back. So we do everything we can to get you over that finish line. I think my final proviso would be make sure that when you hit that send button that you're confident that you've actually submitted what I refer to as competent confidency answers. Because, for example, if you apply for a CSI and in fact your answers are not up to scratch, you will not be awarded an RSI as a compensation. In fact, as I've alluded to, the report will bounce back to you for modification. So take your time to make the best possible application.
Thank you.